Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. It is our great honor to welcome so many music professionals and decision makers from around the world joining today's edition of Resetting the Stage. Resetting the Stage is a global online conference series exploring dynamic challenges and opportunities faced by arts sector professionals. Each conversation convenes a diverse group of industry experts, including public officials, managers, presenters, board members, and other decision makers, who navigate complex questions and examine the evolving landscape of the future of performance. Season two widens the conversation, encourages greater participation, and extends the reach to include the voice of more communities around the world including the addition of simulcast audio translation of all sessions to English and Spanish, and a special add-on entitled Resetting the Stage and Foca Colombia that, following each global con discussion, allows experts from Colombia and across Latin America to adapt ideas raised to the region's unique realities. We are thrilled to have you join us today by participating, exchanging and discussing in these interactive cross-sector and cross-continental conversations to make sense of a performing arts world in transformation. The Global Leaders Programme offers an Ivy League curated executive graduate certificate in social entrepreneurship and cultural agency. Each year, 60 music professionals distinguished by proven accomplishments and a persevering commitment to create change, become part of an international cohort. Led in partnership with nine top universities, among them Harvard, Duke, Georgetown, NYU and McGill, the Global Leaders Program's faculty includes Nobel Prize recipients, Grammy winners and TED presenters. The Spanish Association of Symphony Orchestras, AEOS, is a non-profit association which brings together 35 symphony orchestras from Spain and Portugal. The Spanish Association of Symphony Orchestras has the aim of promoting and developing a range of initiatives to encourage cooperation of its member orchestras, in addition to providing a place where people can meet, exchange information and train. Classical Next is the global gathering for all art music professionals. Representatives from all sectors are offered a place to meet and connect, do business, brainstorm, create and be inspired. Artists, managers, presenters, orchestras, labels, educators, members of the press and more come together each year at the annual event, as well as online throughout the year. Through its international network of professionals, Classical Next helps the global scene collectively optimize what the art music form is and can be. In addition to designing and implementing Colombia's monetary policy, Banco de la República, Colombia's central bank, runs a 29-city countrywide network of cultural centers, libraries and archaeological and art museums. The bank hosts Colombia's preeminent annual chamber music season. Its main recital hall is located in Bogotá and is well known for its award-winning architecture, impressive acoustics and enthusiastic audiences. Before introducing today's distinguished speakers, I would like to share brief housekeeping requests to help make today's session more interactive and engaging for all of you. At the bottom of the screen, you will see a control panel with the chat. Please go over now and write your name, country of residence and your organization. In the control panel, you will also find a Q&A button. You are encouraged to engage directly with our panelists by posing a question for them in this Q&A box. Please submit your questions as early as possible, as there will be a limit to how many can be answered during this session. Real-time interpretation of our sessions is provided. You can choose your preferred language in the interpretation section of your control panel. Today's global session will be followed by a second panel discussion focused on adapting today's themes to the context of the art sector in the Ibero-Americas. This Spanish session will begin 15 minutes after the conclusion of today's global session and will last for 45 minutes. 
we encourage those of you interested in the region to stay for the break and join this special Latin America themed debrief conversation co-presented in alliance with our partner, Fundación Bolivar da Vivienda. Finally, at the close of today's global session, you'll be prompted to complete a brief survey that will appear on your screens. We kindly ask you that you share constructive feedback or suggestions for future sessions as we continue to evolve this growing series to address topics and challenges of relevance to all of you working in the sector around the world. And with that, let's get started. Welcome to today's edition of Resetting the Stage, Season 2, which is entitled On Stage to On Demand, Growing Audiences into Communities. It is great to see so many performing arts professionals joining us today from around the world. In today's edition of Resetting the Stage, the ongoing disruption of concert life accelerates transformations in the ways that artists connect with audiences and we will explore a range of emerging models that are both benefiting and challenging for the performing to arts ecosystem, from presenters, broadcasters, and distributors to labels, managers, and artists. And now it is time to welcome our distinct panel. James Ennis, National Arts Center of Canada. He has established himself as one of the most sought after violinists on the international stage. Alongside his concerto work and collaboration with all stop orchestras, James maintains a busy recital schedule performing regularly at most iconic halls, such as Wigmore Hall, Carnegie Hall, Symphony Center, Chicago, to name just a few. He is the artistic director of the Seattle Chamber Music Society. He has won many awards for his recordings, including two Grammys and many other awards. Recent releases include three volumes of Beethoven sonatas with pianist Andrew Armstrong and concerti by Kernis, Howard, Strauss, and Beethoven. Together with welcoming James, we would like to extend our special thanks to Canada's National Arts Centre Orchestra, who are helping to support the today's session and will be again featured in Contributors to Resetting the Stage on December 10. Currently executive director and CEO of the Houston Symphony, John Mangum has previously served as the president and artistic director of the Philharmonic Society of Orange County, as well as held senior artistic planning roles at the San Francisco Symphony, New York Phil, and the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. John holds a PhD in history of the field in musicology from the University of California. As freelance writer, he has written notes and articles for a variety of record labels, orchestras, presenters, and festivals, including regular contributions to the program books of the Salzburg Festival. Senior brand manager of the Moscow Philharmonic Society and creator of the Museum.org, Maria Holkina has more than 10 years of experience organizing and promoting concerts with all Russian stars and many foreign legends, including Ricardo Muti and Chicago Symphony, Zobin Mehta and Israel Philharmonic, Claudia Abara and Lucerne Festival Orchestra. Today, she is responsible for Philharmonic's social media strategy and content, educational projects for young audiences and video content. She has also launched the first excursion in Moscow devoted to city centers places traditionally connected with classical music. Hervé Boisser is the founder and managing director of Medici TV. Launched in 2008, Medici TV quickly became the leading digital platform for classical music programs in the world. Before Medici, Hervé was managing director of the French indie label Naive, created with Patrick Zelkin in 1998. In the 90s, he held positions at Warner Music France and Warner Classics. He has produced over 500 audio and visual recordings, including winners of many international awards. Clemens Troutman, Deutsche Grammophon. No, he not only holds a doctorate in law, but also studied clarinet at the Music Hochschule Lübeck and the Juilliard School of Music in New York. He is a successful musician and a recognized expert in the fields of classical music, art, culture, and the media business. His career has included various management positions, for instance, at Imonet, a subsidiary of Alex Springer as chief financial officer. Since 2015, he has been president of Deutsche Grammophon, successfully combining the digital world with classical music. Deutsche Grammophon launched the platform DG Stage that streams live performances to the global audience. Today, we will also have two experts that will be contributing on particular issues brought up today. Claudia Rojas, 
Allegro HD has extensive experience in institutional relations, production, press, translation as an on-site interpreter. She is currently managing strategic media partnerships globally with special focus on Latin America for Allegro HD. Christine Roca, Executive Director of the Orchestra now and Conservatory Managing Director of Graduate Studies at Bard College. But first, to begin, it is my pleasure to introduce also today's moderator, Anastasia Bodanuk, to set the stage where our discussion begins. Anastasia is a classical talent manager, producer, and impresario who has been involved in the careers of some of the most compelling performers of our time. In 2015, she founded Primavera Consulting, a firm that focuses on producing high-end classical entertainment events and consulting performing arts organizations all over the world. Additionally, Primavera represents a small roster of artists reinforcing traditional talent management with endorsement opportunities. Responding to the challenges exposed by the COVID crisis, Primavera launched a new partnership venture, Primavera Digital, to help empower artists and performing arts organizations to take control of their digital presence and turn occasional and passive listeners into actively engaged communities. So much for the introduction. Welcome again to all our wonderful panelists and Anastasia, thank you, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gosia. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Never let a good crisis go to waste. We've all heard this before, but we have probably never lived through a crisis of this magnitude. Does it give us proportionately enormous opportunities? That's what we're here to discuss today, particularly in terms of the relationship between our art form and its audience. We're fortunate to have been able to convene today some of the most visionary and experienced people in our field. The people who are actually capable of influencing the course of development. So it is my personal intention that today we don't just have a dynamic discussion, but that we also set some intentions for our collective future. Stepping back from the initial shock of unprecedented cancellations and restrictions, we recognize that uh, this crisis has also given us um, a lot of opportunities, but it hasn't changed the general course of events. It has merely accelerated the trends and processes that have been with us for over a decade. The growing role of digital and social media, the need for more flexible, inclusive, and realistic approach to concert programming, and of course, the necessary adjustments to the business model itself. If we could afford to take our time with these changes before, 2020 has turned them into a, an urgent imperative. Whether we like it or not, our life today has a digital dimension. Today, artists have two stages, in fact, a physical and the digital. Online views of classical music content have been in the hundreds of thousands, and some are in the millions, which is suggesting a much greater potential for engagement with our art form among the audiences that we have previously not explored. The digital stage will never replace or compete with the magic of the live concert experience, but it can enhance the relationship that artists have with their audiences. In a live concert situation, the only opportunity for receiving feedback that an artist has is the applause at the end of the concert and maybe some autograph requests at the stage door. With the digital and particularly social media, the opportunities for participation are much greater. In fact, giving the artist an opportunity not just to reach an audience, but to really build a relationship and to develop his own uh, or her own community. We finally realized that a coherent and well-designed online presence is integral to the public profile of an artist or an ensemble. It is essential to their ability to attract uh, people and ultimately to find their financial security. This means that their activities, as well as the roles of all the other members of the classical music ecosystem are changing. We have no choice but to adapt. With this, I would like to ask our panelists the first question. How is the ongoing disruption of live concerts transforming the relationships between artists, audiences, presenters, labels, talent managers, digital broadcast distributors, and other participants of the system. Mr. Clemens Troutman, let's start with you. Well, with pleasure. 
Hello, everybody, and um, thanks for joining us here. I think this is really an amazing initiative, and I'm happy to be a part of it because I think you know we all need that conversation, that exchange to to find a way forward. And uh, well, if I may say so, our industry has been affected by disruption already uh, 15, 20 years ago, the music industry, and has ever since been in a state of constant change. And probably that was one of the reasons why we had been kind of prepared to act in a agile and swift manner once the lockdown happened in March. And um, we have created both new formats, musical moments and a new platform, DG Stage that already got mentioned basically in a matter of weeks with an amazing team and um, well, a great collaborative effort here at DG and Universal Music together with our artists. And with regards uh, to your questions as to the relationships and, and partnerships, well, the entire ecosystem is out of hinge and collaborative mechanisms long taken for granted are just not working anymore. Just as a simple example, the cross promotional effects of an album release ahead of touring and then in return venue sales on the evening of a concert. Um, in what matters obviously most to us is the relationship with our artists. And um, I can say fortunately it has tightened in the last uh, few months. Um, there hasn't been a single day without any kind of creative proposal or conversation, obviously also because, um, well, you know, we are able together with our artist community to, to provide opportunities, opportunities that maybe to that extent just don't exist anymore in the live space for the time being. And um, we've created new formats. We've been able to attend to and record neglected repertoire, in particular chamber music. And um, so this has been really, really inspiring to facilitate the creative visions of our artists and to invest in joint projects. Let's not forget, this is also about funding the arts, not just about conveying artistic performances. And actually we have invested far beyond what we had budgeted for um, new recordings and new productions. And um, well, in this effort, we are actually also happy to have great partners. Um, just today, we have announced that Siemens and the Siemens Art Program will be our partners on DG Stage, um, growing this platform both technologically um, as well as in terms of new productions. So I'm really, really happy about this partnership, especially since um, as some of you may or may not remember Siemens was also a shareholder of Deutsche Grammophon for many years between the 1940s and the 1980s. Well, no man is an island and no label is an island. So um, despite the ecosystem being out of hint, we are still trying to work with partners and realize and maximize opportunities with presenters in terms of cross-marketing and data analytics. Um, we've done co-productions, actually also with Hervé from Medici and his wonderful team. So um, we you know, really regard this situation as a challenge that we can only um, face and solve jointly. And yeah, with that, uh, thanks for the opportunity of being here with you. Thank you, Clemens. Um, Maria Holkina, who represents the Moscow Philharmonic Society and is the head of the uh, digital initiatives, um, can, you, can you speak to that as well from yeah. the point of view of, uh, yeah. Hello, dear colleagues and audience. In Moscow Philharmonic uh, Society, difficulties led to new opportunities and we presented the a uh, new layer of music to our listeners. And by this new layer, I mean chamber music. Many musicians played what they wanted to play for a long time or uh, appeared in some new qualities. And uh, the audience realized that small ensembles, uh, which do not often play on the big stage, they sound marvelous. And it's 
interesting and no less exciting than a big symphony orchestra. We hope that these ensembles will continue to develop, that musicians will pay more attention to this form of cooperation, because when two, three or five prominent musicians, they are doing something unexpected together, of course, it's very interesting for the audience. And a short supportive quote from our general director, Alexei Shalashov on this matter. He said uh, in interview that all the previous years we lived under the pressure of the principle of efficiency, enchanted by the growing number of listeners. And all the previous years, uh, yes, eh, sorry. And in August when economic factors were no longer decisive, we received the creative carte blanche and it gave rise to many new ideas. So this is my answer. Great, that's, uh, that's very important. I'm, I'm already hearing uh, um, a lot of positive um, things. I mean, of course, we're, we're not going to deny that this is a challenge, but I'm really glad that this is not turning into a, a group therapy session <laughs> with everybody talking about how difficult things have been because, uh, you know, as Clemens just uh, pointed out, opportunities for new partnerships or strengthening uh, existing partnerships and uh, discovery of new repertoire is something that you both have talked about. So. Those are all very encouraging things. Um, James Anus, he, you were one of the uh, first people to start streaming from your home. And um, you have set a great example for artists who have all rushed to get their content online. Um, can you tell us how your life and your situation specifically has been affected by all this? Well, I think that each performer uh, that's been affected has been affected in a unique way. Uh, for myself, you know, I live in a small town in West Florida. Uh, I was was very jealous of some of my colleagues. Uh, I'm thinking, well, Clemens, of course, I'm thinking of uh, Daniel Hope being in Berlin and having the opportunity to work with, um, with these fantastic production teams and, and of course, very safely and, and very responsibly. But uh, I found myself in my, my very beautiful part of the world, I'm happy to be here, but uh, really cut off from everything. And it became a challenge of how to, um, how to become my own presenter, my own distributor, my own videographer. Uh, I think that everyone in the industry has been forced to move outside of his or her comfort zone. And I think that's not a bad thing. I think that uh, we have all learned so much uh, about subjects that we probably should have been studying long before this happened um, to continue the theme of this being really a moment of opportunity uh, for people. I think that it seems obvious enough, but just to state that when you play a live performance, your audience is limited to who can be in that place at that time. Whereas now uh, we have the opportunity to play for anyone who is interested anywhere they are. So. I've been, I've been really fascinated with the, the concept of connecting directly with one's audience because of course all of the different sides of this production ecosystem, they all have their different priorities. And you know, generally speaking, it's a symbiotic thing where a presenter, um, maybe a, an orchestra, a soloist, everyone is basically trying to achieve the same thing but when we've now been forced into this this period of survival um, we might all have slightly different things that we're trying to achieve and connecting directly with an audience uh, i know this is something we're going to talk about somewhat later today but that's been uh, a fascinating challenge and something that that i've i've enjoyed you know from a performer's point of view a lot of the digital uh, streaming material uh, has been sort of incidental to the to the main product. You know, you, I'm thinking in terms of when I get hired to play with a, with an orchestra. Quite often, it's just written into the contract, like maybe we will broadcast this on the radio, or maybe we'll stream it, or maybe we'll put it on our uh, our digital media provider, and it's, it's been basically understood that that's kind of part and parcel to the deal. Um, it, it, it's used as a way to bring people to the real product, which is the live performance. Um, whereas right now we don't, 
in many places, we don't have that real product. The real product is now only the digital end. So how can we make that really compelling? How can we make that really accessible? And do we think of this as a short-term opportunity to reach as many people as possible to build our brand um, with the hope that that will then increase uh, demand at a later point when things get back to normal? Or do we really have to look at this as an actual business model going forward? And that's something that can't be answered except in a very individual way. I mean, everyone, uh, and it's been fascinating to see that with, uh, with performing musicians. For some people, they're treating this absolutely as an opportunity to expand the, band, uh, the brand, expand the brand, expand the brand. Uh, for others, it's how do I pay the bills this month? So there's no, there's no right answers to this, but it, it certainly has been interesting to see how the, the people that are willing to be most nimble and most flexible, I think are the ones that are seeing the most success. Thank you, James. I think that's uh, very important uh, to think about. What, what do we do when this is over? I mean, we've sort of assumed that uh, these uh, certain changes will, will kind of stay with us forever, but there will be a time when people are able to go to concerts. You know, in some places like Moscow, for instance, uh, uh, Maria will tell you they have concerts on every night already. So what happens to everything that we're doing now in the digital realm? Do we hold on to it? Do we... Uh, put it more on the service of the live performances. These are all the things that um, I'd love for us to to think about as we as we talk and maybe to uh, dive into that a little bit deeper um, later in the discussion. Um, John, John Mangum, um, I'd love to hear from from you because uh, James has just said um, something interesting about reaching an audience that's not constrained geographically to uh, a specific location. Um, you have put your uh, musicians online with uh, various uh, programs that were not, you know, big orchestral programs. Um, what sort of an audience have you been hoping to reach? And did, did, you, did you reach that audience? Did you reach other people? Who, who's, your, who's your target group? Yeah, and, and let me just uh, uh, kind of add to the voices that you've already heard, which is that we've also found great opportunity in this. And uh, I would say in, in kind of unexpected ways and unexpected places. And to answer your question specifically, Anastasia, I think that we viewed our move into live streaming, which we made very quickly. I mean, running an orchestra is like being the captain of the Titanic or something. Just imagine the slowest moving boat and maybe you can get away from the iceberg, maybe you can't. But we've moved incredibly quickly uh, and, and shifted to a, a heavy online strategy uh, with weekly live concerts that are live streamed. And we were anticipating this really as a way to preserve our connection with our audience in the near term. So, um, you know, as with so many orchestras, especially in the United States, our audience tends to be older and of course, so they're at, at more risk for this virus. And we wanted to be sure that they could continue to access the symphony from their homes. And uh, what we've actually discovered with the pivot is while about 70% of the people that we reach each week come from the greater Houston metropolitan area. Houston's the fourth largest city in the United States. The metropolitan area has a population of about 6 million. 30% uh, of the people that we reach in any given week are from outside of Houston. Um, ten, uh, uh, a third of those are from other places in Texas, but the rest of them are from around the United States. And we also have a small international audience each week. And so we've really discovered that this is a way to not only reach our audience here in Houston, but also to expand the platform, the reputation, uh, the the reach of the symphony beyond our own community, which has been, which has been critical. Thank you, John. Hervé, you've been very busy um, since the beginning of this uh, of, of the pandemic. You've been. Uh, delivering fantastic content to people uh, during the lockdown and now in the, uh, in the weeks and months since uh, uh, the situation has relaxed a little bit. Uh, but in a way, that's what you've been doing before. So has your life changed at all as the result of all this? Hey. <clears throat> good, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. And thanks for 
invitation. Um, I wouldn't say in the way we were used to do it before because uh, for some concerts, some events, yes, but most of them have been invented uh, <clears throat> in a very different way because uh, obviously when the lockdown started, uh, almost everything was canceled and we, uh, <clears throat> we, we saw that it was absolutely essential to, uh, to produce uh, and connect the people and continue the relationship in these uh, very strange days. So we produced uh, many uh, concerts actually ourselves. So we did our own series. Uh, we did many uh, filming, recording of, of existing concerts, let's say, but uh, film without any audience. Uh, or in different places, different venues than it was planned before. We created the, the virtual Verbier Festival. Verbier Festival has been from the very beginning at Medici, um, a peak of the season every summer. Uh, and of course it was uh, not happening this year. So we uh, did something which was very interesting, very creative because it was a mix of interviews archive, but also a uh, new material, new recording, especially did for uh, that virtual festival. And every day for 18 days, we had a, a very strong program. So, uh, you know, it was a bunch of very different um, initiatives, uh, but all together, yes, we've been very busy and we, we kept the relationship with uh, the artist, uh, with the partners. Uh, <clears throat> EG was part of it, as, as Clemens mentioned that, and uh, uh, all the ecosystem was still very uh, active uh, and we were active with them. Uh, now, of course, the question is um, how long can it, can it continue? Because uh, the duration of the crisis is the key question, you know, especially for the artists. I mean, it has been mentioned before. Our main concern, and I think the, the real priority we all have is to save the artists community is to save the artists themselves because without them we don't exist of course we can do sometimes and um, you know one shots projects like we can produce like we did we all did that but you know on a long-term base if we don't have a strong and safe artistic community that doesn't work by definition so uh that's really the for for, for us and i think for all of us that's a key question how our um, uh, governments, how um, all the usual partners, it can be public partners, it can be private partners, whatever, how the, the arts institutions can survive. Uh, because when you see that most of them for the moment, especially in the US, I mean, the perspectives are extremely uh, worrying, financially speaking, on a very concrete base, you know, how they pay the wages, how they can maintain a tour how can they continue to support their community, etc. I mean, that's, that's extremely concrete. And um, on short term, okay, we can, we can manage, let's say. It's difficult, of course, we have lost a lot of opportunities, etc. cetera, but uh, we, we've been able to, 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 to find a way to, to uh, resist and even more to, to develop. Uh, because, uh, in fact, the promotion given to the streaming, to performing art streaming has never been so, so high than during this, uh, this lockdown and pandemic because many, many people actually discovered that it could be fun, interesting, uh, educating uh, to watch a, a live performance or just a, a streaming of, of an opera, of a concert, etc. Because, of course, don't, we shall not forget that concerts, it's, let's say, easy to, to find uh, alternative plans, but operas, ballet, it's much more difficult, obviously. And we know that without a strong opera scene, uh, the public and the new public will be difficult to, to, to enlarge, to convince. So I think we, of course, in every bad situation, there is a good, there is some good, uh, there is some opportunities, of course, disruptions, we love that. I mean, at Medici, we, we have all be, always been uh, in, in a disruptive process, so we love it. We love to, to push the limits and to, to break the walls, definitely. Um, 
always happy to do that. The question is the ecosystem and the artistic community, how long they can continue, how can we make sure they are sustainable. That's really a, a big concern because short term, maybe there is some support, help, so care. Uh, mid term, who knows? Even if, obviously, if the vaccine is coming, etc. I mean, on the on the on the on the health situation, we all hope, of course, that as soon as possible there is some solutions. But financially speaking, on on a bigger economic scale, uh, it's extremely um, stressful to see uh, the long term impact the musicians, the artists uh, will 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 experience. And that's, I think, a topic we we shall never forget, and we shall really consider and cover right now, today, not not tomorrow, because we need them. Thank you, Hervé. Um, I would like to ask um, a question, since you you've uh, you've spoken quite a bit about the artists and uh, the need to to keep them safe and the need for them to. Uh, uh, to be protected in this uh, in this challenging situation, um, I'm wondering if um, if we can talk about the the support systems and the qualities that artists need specifically in the situation where um, their kind of one way relationship with the audience has become a two way relationship. Thank you, thanks to the the, the social media that uh, and, and the digital media outlets that that they have. Um, James, let me uh, come back to you on this because uh, you are an artist, so obviously you had to uh, learn quite a quite a lot on the go. Um, what are the skills and support mechanisms that would be particularly helpful? Well, I think that uh, I think that this idea of it being a two-way relationship is something that uh, the people have recognized the importance of this for some time. I think this is just accelerating the. Uh, the process of people becoming kind of adept at, at maximizing the potential. Uh, there are things, even things that can seem quite artificial. I, during uh, streamed performances of the past few months, I've been involved in quite a number of these virtual green rooms. And they sometimes feel, as I said, really artificial or forced or, or just somewhat strange and unsuccessful. But it, it's always touching to me how it seems to mean a lot to a lot to people, you know, that we have to be conscious at this time where people can access, you know, the opportunity for a listener right now is, is they can access performances, virtual performances from all over the world. Uh, they don't, a, a listener in your city where, you're, where you may have a, a traditional base does not necessarily have to turn to you anymore for their music. So how can you establish that relationship so that the audience truly wants to invest in you. And I think a lot of that is through a, a personal connection. Uh, at my chamber music festival in Seattle, uh, we, we pivoted very, very quickly this spring to turn what had been a series of 12 live concerts into a series of 12 streamed concerts. And, uh, you know, there was a lot to learn. We had some, some successes, some failures, but I, I think that as we've received a lot of feedback about it, what we've really learned is that people enjoyed this feeling of it being a very personal and very intimate experience. Uh, hearing the musicians talk about what inspires them in the music, why they are particularly excited to share a particular piece of music with with their listeners. So I think that um, I think that it's really in the best interest of, of presenters, uh, performers, of ever of everyone to to create a situation where the audience can get to know the performer because it's that sort of feeling of personal interaction that really uh, leads to that investment that I think pays long term dividends. And as I said, this is nothing new. You know, I. I've always felt that there's uh, a tremendous benefit to just taking a few minutes to, to meet your audience, to speak with your audience, to share um, in this mutual love of the art form. So um, yeah, I think that, as I said, this is just now a time for, uh, for really making the most of those opportunities. 
Thank you, James. Um, I'd like to um, ask Christine Roca, um, the executive director of the orchestra now, to, uh, to answer the same question, because you, you, you James, you, you've been around for the, the block for, for, for a few years. You, you're, uh, you're an established artist, you have your own audience. Um, and so uh, Christine is, is working with a new generation of artists who are just learning to uh, uh, well, learning to perform, but also learning all these additional skills. So I wonder if how much of that can be programmed into the curriculum and uh, whether the um, approach to music education um, should be different in any way now that we know that these uh, different challenges are, um, are part of the musicians' uh, everyday lives. Thanks so much, Anastasia. Uh what I think we're in a very unique situation, Maestro Leon Botstein, who is both our music director as well as the president of Bard College, who founded the Orchestra Now, he founded on the conviction that to have a competitive and enduring career, a modern instrumentalist must have the desire and ability to understand the context of what they do and to communicate their art form in innovative ways to their audience. So our curriculum from the start was designed to expose an orchestra musician to opportunities that call for the cultivation of skills beyond the concert hall. So the goals of our program were tactical, practical, help musicians hone their skills as researchers, writers, speakers, critical thinkers, basically becoming better communicators capable of sharing their knowledge of music, engaging with different audiences, and reimagining the place and role of the orchestras today. So our program was designed basically to help musicians navigate what they're going through in their environment right now. Uh, when we had to shut down in March and everything went virtual, this was an opportunity for us. And we basically took what we had already put into place and then just put in new ways for them to learn from it. Uh, we've always told them to think outside of the box. They're young, imaginative musicians. But now we told them to reach even more outside of the box. This is such a great creative experience for them to be able to find their own voice as a solo performer and in smaller groups, as everybody's been talking about, that we definitely went to put into our structure ways for them to be able to do that, showing them how to shift to make a home studio, as James was talking about, for them to be able to do videos of themselves, how to make these videos on social media that they were introducing themselves to the audience as opposed to just the piece of music. Uh, and then now that we've actually come back into person in September here on campus, we do have restrictions we're following, but they are performing in chamber settings. And now we're teaching them the whole way of dealing with streaming a concert, uh, which is different. They don't have an audience feedback. They don't have that energy there. So what we've been helping them do is understanding how the camera setups work and how just even different camera angles will help them to help with different pieces of the music to uh, basically intensify the experience of how it's becoming more visual, not just what they're hearing. So we've been very fortunate that we have kind of this nest right now for them that they don't have to pay any tuition. We actually have a stipend for them. So we feel like we're able to set them up artistically to be ready to move out from the program regardless if they're able to go back to what they're used to as an orchestra or if it is going to be a while before they get in front of an audience again and giving them the ability to see how they're able to take their music and perform it in these different mediums that are coming about. Great. Thank you, Christine. Um, I'd like to shift gears a little bit and come back to um, Clemens Troutman was uh, the following question because we, we've been talking quite a bit about this, uh, uh, the relationship between the artist and the audience uh, becoming a, a two way relationship. Um, so in this new situation, um, do the traditional gateways between the artist and the audience, such as the label, for instance, that you Clemens represent, um, do they become obsolete? And how much control is a traditional structure willing to give up in, um, in, in this effort to stay relevant and to, uh, to adjust to this change? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I'm not quite certain whether I agree with uh, some of the premises of your question. 
and um, actually have never considered Deutsche Grammophon or a label as a traditional gateway, let alone establishment or a gatekeeper, given um, the constant innovation that came out of our company and well, at times that we were you know, forced to go through and to embrace. And actually, DG started as a hardware and technology company in 1898, producing gramophones and adding the performing arts recording business as just another arm. And well, ever since we have been a content company, um, we have interestingly returned to technology as of late. And um, speaking of that two-way relationship between artists and audiences, um, well, in that relationship, there needs to be a medium that connects and that facilitates and that conveys messages and music and art in, in both directions. And um, we actually see DG as such a home or such a medium. And let me just give you um, a few examples uh, on how we're trying to, to achieve that and um, establish that connection. Um, many of you may be aware of the um, wonderful project that Max Richter has created with Sleep, which is an eight hour lullaby in his own words. And uh, this is music that is incredibly creative and, and also comforting. And it just um, addresses the human mind in a very different state half sleeping, um, half awake. And we have created an app to um, convey that experience. And we have by now already had um, 200,000 installs of that app and people actually listening to Max's music um, every night uh, through that piece of technology that we've created. And uh, it gives them a lot of comfort that they can also share in a journal. And uh, so I think um, this is just a minor example of we, uh, what we as a label can do to you know, facilitate that connection between our artists, their music, and the audiences. And another example that's maybe a little bit more relevant even for this group of people is DG Stage, where we host um, ticketed live events, performances, um, most of them recorded um, slightly be beforehand, uh, live on tape. And uh, let me just outline briefly how we got there, that we felt we do need to establish that stage and react to a need and um, a desire of our arts that transpired through many conversations. So um, when the lockdown happened in March, um, basically the same week um, we got in touch with our artists or they got in touch with us with, with ideas, how to, how to deal with that situation and um, how to make sure that the performing arts stay present and, and relevant in people's lives. And um, the first format that we came up with was um, a video production format called Musical Moments, where we partnered with um, a recording studio, Emil Berliner studio, with um, a video team and created um, a framework in which we could produce um, chamber music um, and both in an audiovisual format and in an audio format. And uh, those audio tracks also get released in a playlist um, available on most, um, on most um, um, streaming partner services um, and also um, we have partnered for instance with Arte and with Medici to um, make this wonderful performances this content available to a global audience um, and that I think was a very very good start but at the same time we felt um, that um, through public broadcasters um, content was you know, made possible, but it was also um, given away, which is, I acknowledge that part of a public broadcaster's mission, it was made available for free. And um, I actually 
uh, have a concern, um, not a purely commercial concern um, from the perspective of a label, but also from the perspective of the ecosystem as a whole, as um, media opportunities for um, all artists. And James has just, you know, um, really, really made a good point about that as media opportunities um, have become so important um, as the live performance schedule um, is very slim, um, then I think it would be totally wrong to raise expectations with an audience that is just getting accustomed to digital media in the classical music space to set a standard and raise an expectation that everything, um, this wonderful art that you guys are creating, James and many others, um, that this should be available for free. And this is why we felt um, we needed to introduce an additional service, um, which we dubbed DG Stage, and where we actually uh, ask people to purchase tickets for uh, online performances. Um, to be very honest and frank, this is um, a business model in a nascent state. This is not something that uh, has seen um, uh, super um, safe proof of concept, but it is working. People are willing, despite all of the free content that is out there, to really devote time, to devote resources and money to these concert experiences. And I think this is, this is really, really encouraging. And um, we will definitely proceed on, on that road, offering um, these opportunities to our artists to connect with their audiences and um, being a facilitator and, and home to them. And obviously, um, we are lucky to work with entrepreneurial artists like Daniel Hope, um, whom James has mentioned, um, who out of nowhere, out of the blue, created a format uh, Hope at Home. And we were able to help here and there, but this is something that he created in a matter of days together with Arte. But obviously they are um, also, I think every artist is an entrepreneur, um, but the degree and, and the quality of entrepreneurship is, um, is different with, with you know, each. And um, there are also artists that uh, are not so much into building their own studios in living rooms or um, developing um, powerful social media channels and, and online outlets. And um, we want to be, as Deutsche Grammophon, a home to these artists equally or possibly even more and facilitate and magnify what they, what they have to say, what they're creating. And what's helpful in this respect is that we have a truly global brand and this brand is pretty much known everywhere across the globe with um, a 95 to 99% brand awareness in the classical community and an average of 30% uh, in Western um, territories of um, brand awareness in the general audience. And this enables us to reach as many fans as possible, to use any avenue possible to bring um, the music and the art um, that's created by our artist community to the audiences. And obviously, like um, I said initially, we are working with, with partners and uh, just two examples um, of institutions with whom we have collaborated on DG Stage. One is um, the Bayreuth Festival. So we have been able to create a virtual Bayreuth Festival with the essentially same productions that would have been shown this summer um, on DG stage and the resonance was extremely encouraging. And also probably in this Beethoven anniversary year, we have um, created together with the Orchestre Metropolitain and Yannick Nessé-Séguin, the, the first uh, full Beethoven cycle post lockdown. And I think you know, these two um, endeavors um, can make us very proud and, and the resonance has been tremendous. 
Thank you very much, Clemens. Um, two, two things uh, to move us forward. I think um, the question of um, uh, artists who are perhaps not so uh, keen on uh, moving into this digital direction and suddenly learning all these new skills and uh, setting up their own home studio, that, that's an important one because obviously um, artists are who they are and some of them will not embrace it and um, I wonder if that makes them more vulnerable in the situation and uh, generally the question is who, who becomes the most vulnerable uh, part of this ecosystem as we move into this uh, uh, new environment. Um, this is a question that I would like to address to all of the panelists at the end of the discussion but uh, to make it interesting we thought that we would also ask all of our participants, all of you who, who've tuned in from all around the world, um, please respond to this question as you, 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 as you think is right. And uh, you'll have um, uh, a, a poll that is being set up behind the scenes. Uh, you can uh, vote. And then at the end, we will collate all the results. And once we've heard from the experts, we will reveal uh, the, the, the wisdom of our attendees and uh, we'll see how they compare. So is it the artists, is it promoters, or presenters, labels, broadcasting networks, distributors, audiences, talent managers, cast your votes. Um, the other uh, point that um, uh, Clemens has uh, introduced, which I would like to build on a little bit, is the question of value and the question of revenue. Um, thank you very much for pointing out uh, the elephant in the room, which of course, you know, it's great that uh, we have so much content now being uh, readily offered to uh, the audiences worldwide, most of it for free. Um, is it a good idea? Is it not a good idea to, to, to create this expectation that uh, anybody anywhere would have access to uh, uh, this art, which of course is expensive to, to produce, it's expensive to create. If you take into uh, consideration the cost of uh, music education and the, uh, to, to begin with, not to mention uh, all the rest of it, it's, it's not, uh, it doesn't just magically appear. And so should it be offered for free or should it be offered for a price? Where is the greatest value? Where is the greatest revenue? Those are the things that I'd like to uh, spend the rest of our time on this discussion um, exploring. So let's start with value. Um, I would like to ask Maria Holkin in Moscow and John Mangum in Houston, two very different situations, very different perspectives. Uh, both are presenting organizations, both are doing quite a lot in digital media. Why do you think it's important to do what you do? Is it to keep the existing audiences connected when they can't come to the live performances, or is it to attract new audiences? John has touched on that a little bit. I'd like uh, both of you to, uh, to uh, get into it a little bit more. Maria. Uh, answering your question, I can say that there is no or only, and uh, there is no uh, or motivating existing audience or attracting new communities. Of course, it's either. And uh, I will try to stay optimistic again on this panel, uh, like we are all here in Russia, in Moscow Philharmonic, despite everything that happens around. And in terms of motivating existing audience, uh, the Moscow Philharmonic Society works on the subscription system. That means that significant part of our audience is permanent. And from the very beginning of pandemic, our position is what we um, cannot abandon is either the musician or our listeners. They should be able to stay in touch with us in any circumstances, listen to music and see and hear their favorite musicians. So this idea was the driving force behind the creation of the home season project. When uh, musician performed in front of the empty Tchaikovsky concert hall and we aired it online. In the pandemic and especially after the renewal of concert life, the, con uh, the contact with our regular listeners uh, became even closer, much closer. The listeners had many questions and we used all communication channels to answer them, inform them about our plans, the current situation, etc. And I want to say that many uh, listeners, they 
uh, they were so kind. They didn't want to they money back for the tickets. They wanted to us to save it. So to only just to help the musical life to continue. And of course, during this time, especially two months, last two months, we communicated much more closely with our loyal audience, learned a lot about them. And this is an expected bonus of these difficult situations. And uh, about the new audience as well, uh, cooperation with the largest social, largest Russian social media is a win-win strategy for us. We give them the unique content of the highest quality for free. They help us to attract the new audience. Uh, over the last season, oh, only on the Vkontakte social network, which is uh, originally targeted to the younger audience, our broadcasts have uh, had more than 13 million views. Uh, during the home season project, listeners actively corresponded in chats. They sent applause emojis and thanked the performance. And um, it felt like the moment of the um, maximum in the moment of maximum disconnection, it was an act of uh, real unification. And organizing all this was a highly demanding and highly responsive task, but responsible. But as a result, the Moscow Philharmonic, as I said, had not only uh, ha held the attention of the audience we already have, but also found new fans. And uh, Anastasia asked me to, to tell a, a little about numbers and uh, I, on average the our networks all over increased their reach and subscribers by 30 percent during the pandemic before the pandemic the website has 20 th 26 thousand registered users and now it's 72 thousand our email subscribers grew from 100,000 to 150,000. So we really grew in terms of audience. And of course, now we have to hope that uh, after the pandemic, we will meet these wonderful people in our concert halls in person. Thank you, Maria. John, what about your, your experience in Houston? Thanks, Anastasia. So, um, I would say that we have a lot in common with what Maria just outlined for Moscow. Uh, we have a mix of subscribers and then we also have single ticket buyers. And we really started back in March with the lockdown from the question of how do we keep our audience connected to the orchestra when the orchestra can't gather to perform and the audience can't gather to hear them. And so I, it sounds like we started with a, a sort of similar initiative. At first, we just said, musicians, use your iPhones, your cameras, whatever you've got at home, and make short videos. Try to keep them less than five minutes and try not to use copyrighted material. So those were the two uh, things that we asked them to do. And we were able to really aggressively uh, uh, sort of flood our social media channels and our website with these musician produced videos. And also we have a, a huge audio archive going back to when Stokowski and John Barbaroli were our music directors and we were able to uh, use those performances to uh, populate a, a, a web uh, media hub so that people could stay connected. And that was just a quick and dirty kind of effort to, to, to get that content out there. Then in May and June, we moved into what we called the living room series. We had a, a small camera and microphone set up that we delivered to musicians' homes. Uh, we had, most musicians were in Houston. We had a musician in Colorado and a musician in Detroit participate as well. Um, and really it was just for them to give an hour long recital from their home. And we tried to target musicians who we knew lived with other musicians so that they could do some small chamber pieces and things like that. And that created an incredible connection with audience because it was so personal and musicians talking about their background, their family, why they loved a certain piece of music, you know, it really humanized them and, and created a personal connection with the audience. So really delivered on our goal of, of, of making that connection. And then in July, starting in the middle of July, we moved to live concerts in our primary concert venue, Jones Hall, at first just in front of cameras. We were lucky to have an in-hall IMAG image magnification uh, set up in place that we could enhance with the purchase of some robotic cameras and a great team that was used to doing that work just shifted to doing that for a live stream audience. 
And uh, the, the numbers around both of these I thought were encouraging. So for the living room series, which were weekly Friday night recitals from musicians' homes, uh, we had 1,670 unique purchasers. We sold 4,400 tickets. 315 of those people were new to our system and 152 of them became new donors because we charged $10 for this, but we also asked people to, to make a contribution if they could. For the Live from Jones Hall series, that's the weekly Saturday night live concerts from our concert venue, uh, we had uh, almost 3,000 unique purchasers so far, just in July, August, and the first half of September, these numbers are for. Uh, we sold over 15,000 tickets, uh, 650 of these people were new to file, 600 new donors coming out of this, and so far just in two and a half months, $250,000 in revenue. Now our annual budget pre-pandemic was $35 million, but still this becomes a significant new revenue stream for us. If the revenue continues to hold and we don't see any signs that it won't, you know, this could be between a million and $1.2 million for our fiscal year, which is, which is significant new revenue. And getting to Hervé's point from earlier, really we're looking at surviving on contributed income. In the United States, orchestras raise a lot of money. Uh, before the pandemic, we had about 3,000 donors that were contributing about $20 million a year to the orchestra. Um, now we have 3,750. And the other big statistic that I think is, is critical is that, you know, in a typical year between our live concerts and our community engagement and education activities, we reached about 400,000 people. Um, since March with this video content, we've had close to, we're, we're, we're closing in on a million views. And, and those are people who actually stop and uh, take at least 60 seconds to, to watch this content. Um, and, and that is just exponential in terms of the way that we've increased our reach. I mean, that would be the number of people that we'd reach in multiple years. So a lot of good has come out of this, even though the financial challenges are significant. Thank you, John. Um, the question of revenue, very briefly, I'd like to address that to um, Hervé, because you, you run a platform um, that is subscription based. Um, and one of the things that we've seen is that a lot of platforms, similar platforms have sprung up. Um, there's Idagio, there is uh, Stage Hub, there, there are all kinds of uh, different platforms. Many of those are also hoping to get people to subscribe, but an average person, no matter how much they love classical music, can only have that many subscriptions because they're also going to have Netflix, they're also going to have Apple Music or Spotify. Um, do you think there is a, um, a, a more flexible approach to where micropayments for specific types of content could be introduced so that people can, uh, can pay for, for, for one specific thing that they want to watch? And do you think that that would actually increase the revenue um, as opposed to just hoping for, uh, to gain as many subscribers as possible? I think if I may, I would like to comment, uh, to come back to the previous question about the, the, the value chain and uh, free versus uh, not free. Because I think, of course, we all hope to see uh, a good business uh, development by definition. But on the other hand, I'm not sure uh, the, the question is free versus not free. The question is how we have a good business model. Because look, the television, most of the television is for free and is doing very well. And for the sports or for their content, they found a great business model with a lot of free access, a lot of behind the paywall access or subscription access or whatever. It's a diverse uh, system and model. And I think uh, we shall, again, never uh, forget where we are coming from. And, and performing arts is extremely diverse. Look, we have... Um, Moscow Philharmonie, which is really uh, based on a public service, really uh, dedicated to the community in Moscow, very much supported by the government. And it's a, it's a great initiative because classical music is at the center of, of, of the policy, I would say, of, of these people. Uh, Houston is more a mix of very much more dependent on, on, on public, uh, on private donors, <laughs> sorry, uh, only, and without them, uh, it can't work. And each uh, penny, each dollar is good to take because that's the sum of 
all of them, which makes it uh, valuable. Uh, Paris Opera is a different story. So the Met is closed because, I mean, it's very, very tough financially. The Paris is in between, maybe, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, DG with Clement is a pure, like Medici, you know, we are private companies under the pressure of returns of investments, that's for sure, because without that, we cannot deliver and we cannot reinvest in office, in programs, in people, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the diversity of, of the uh, actual uh, performing arts community institutions, um, national situations, I mean, how can you compare the support given to the arts in the US, in Europe, in Russia, in China, et cetera, et cetera. So I think to look for a, a magical, unique answer, which says, oh, it must be, uh, you must pay something, is um, not enough, um, is, is, is not the answer. The answer is a bit of different systems, models. All of them have to create a value. And that's the question we all face today, that for sure, uh, streaming, such so many content for free the question is is it creating a value for the moment clearly not because none of us are really developing a business a uh, single video streaming business which is profitable we are all we all linked that to we all uh, plug that to other businesses which make it which makes it successful uh, Medici TV, okay, it's, it's, a, it's probably the most advanced platform worldwide, but there is around the B2C, around the subscription model, other business like production, I mean the usual production, let's say, uh, B2B with our education channel, etc. At the end, it's all streaming, it's all at the service of this, of this uh, development, but it's interesting to see that um, it's not Netflix, you know, Netflix is totally driven by its capacity to grow the number of subscribers watching audiovisual content. That's it. It's a single uh, objective and uh, there is no much diversification around. It's very, very uh, uh, clear that they have to get more uh, and more subscribers. That's it. So I think that's, uh, of course, we, I mean, we are based, it's a subscription model uh, based, as you said, it's true. We are even considering and, and testing some pay-per-view, some ticketing. We try every kind of, of monetization. I mean, there is uh, no doubt about that. We shall never uh, say, oh, that will be the successful way because there is no unique model. It's too, again, fragmented. But from the beginning, from the performing arts, from the artist, and then after in the value chain, the record labels, uh, the platforms, the televisions, because there is still a lot of, of support on fun funding from the public television, uh, the management, etc. I mean, um, we shall neglect any, uh, any way of, of monetization. Uh, for the moment, nobody has a single answer. And uh, the challenge is still there, you know, it's completely open. Who will really find the, 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 the right way? You know, it's too early to say uh, because of the, of the diversity and the complexity of the, of the system. Thank you, Hervé. Um, I'd like to ask Claudia Rojas, who works with uh, um, national broadcasting channels, for her comments on this very briefly, because we're going straight into uh, the question and answer session after that. Claudia? Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you, Anastasia. Um, well, I mean, I, we are a channel designed for Latin America. We broadcast in six countries. We are a paid TV model. So our business model is business to business. Uh, we um, gain our, I mean, revenue by selling our content to different um, cable operators. And this works for us really well. So um, considering that I'm speaking from Latin America, from Buenos Aires specifically, and that uh, this uh, video technology in filming concerts is rather new, uh, um, before we can talk about monetizing, I have to think about what are the conditions this content has to have in order to be able to justify the fact and have people willing to uh, spend money on it. So the first uh, key to success, I think, is uh, providing the best and broadest content 
in the sense, the bundling of paid TV subscriptions still is a very sensible approach to make viewers feel like they can find all of the content that they want in a single place. And uh, even I think that in streaming services, rebundling is a phenomenon that is going to be happening. Uh, I can think of, for example, Amazon teaming up with local telcos in Latin America to, in order to reach broader audiences. So I would suggest that strategy for anyone trying to penetrate a market such as Latin America, where in certain countries, like the one I'm living in, uh, the access to foreign currency is almost uh, impossible. So, you know, teaming up with companies that uh, already have a presence in the area and that can charge these services in the local currency is actually very profitable. The second element is that uh, the content has to feel authentic and different. It cannot be an exact replica of the concert experience. And, um, t and we have to be aware of that as television and, and different platforms that we have a distinct advantage over live conscious, which means that uh, we can play a little bit with uh, what the experience of classical music is present, how it is presented. Uh, we don't need to imagine radical changes. Sometimes just explaining the content while we're listening to it can be very enriching. This flexibility is also important if we want to uh, think about advertisers. And I think that um, classical music in Latin America is a little bit uh, timid and inflexible artists promote their see that reflected so much in the um, searching for adver potential advertisers I mean does it make sense that if I see children playing instruments masterfully they should be selling me a Rolex uh, I think um, classical music has to look more at different forms of entertainment Netflix is looking at Fortnite. why are we not looking more at sports where you know uh, we can see possibly see an endemic non-endemic brands luxury and prestige and mass market brands woven effortlessly together so uh, in conclusion whatever the revenue strategy we cannot interrupt the user or viewer from attaining a seamless experience of discovery like our viewers enjoy this musical bubble we've created all advertising from our partners contributes to the sense of accompaniment people get from our channel. And of course, we cannot give up on live music. Everyone in the business is in this because we've had experiences with classical music that have enriched our lives. And, uh, and if there's something I admire greatly from uh, some of the speakers here today is that they've created brands that we can touch. And uh, this is something very important, you know, to be ubiquitous really it's it doesn't mean to have the most developed digital tentacles it means uh having opportunities in which you can or people can have a sense that you're changing someone's lives and like the presence that uh dg has in the formation of its products or like this uh dg stage or uh the presence that um medici has in uh, music competitions really does make that difference and uh, we have to still uh, aspire to that. Thank you Claudia, that's beautifully put. Um, thank you to all the panelists. We're going to uh, go uh, through a few questions from the audience. I ask you to please keep your answers very brief because we have about 10 minutes left and we'd like to get through as many questions as possible. The first question is for John Mangum from uh, Tom Spurgeon in London at the Philharmonia Orchestra. How have the recent events, including uh, the public awareness of Black Lives Matter, influenced the diversity of programming for your activity? Are you looking to broader genres of music or cross uh, disciplinary work? So we made a commitment right at the outset of this that uh, because we had to reprogram all of the concerts anyway uh, to accommodate musicians on stage with the social distancing rules, that we would include a, a piece by an, a historically underrepresented composer, whether that's black, uh, female composers, Hispanic Latin American composers. Uh, and we've been doing that since July with some very significant discoveries. We've actually uh, been working our way through pieces of, of Florence Price and, and uh, 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 We've got a, a wonderful program actually that James is leading with us next week uh, that includes a piece by Philip Herbert for, for strings that, that is a kind of a memorial 
uh, based on uh, Von Williams' Lark Ascending. So really have discovered some wonderful repertoire and uh, also, we, we do uh, an amount of, of uh, POPs programming as well. And, uh, you know, really look very carefully in both our classical and our POPs at how we handle representation with the soloists and conductors that we hire as well. So we've, we've been uh, very aware of that and, and trying to make sure that we uh, are really uh, diversifying our offerings, both in terms of the music we program, but also in terms of the artists with whom we collaborate. Great. Um, the next question we have is for Clemens uh, Troutman um, from Pavel Sivchak uh, at the Royal Academy of Music in London. Um, Pavel says, what I found quite refreshing in that is that during the lockdown, a lot of artists took initiative into their own hands and particularly unrepresented artists who got a platform to reach wider audiences. Should this situation perhaps be a chance for labels, managers, and promoters to open their roster a little bit? What do you think, Clemens? Well, I've been browsing through these questions, and actually, um, if I could have picked one question, I would have picked that one, Pavel. <laughs> so good, good choice, Anastasia. Excellent. Because I feel um, Pavel makes a very important point here. Um, with also the production routines having changed uh, in the course of the pandemic, but actually not in the course of the pandemic, but it's been an ongoing development. Um, I think we are more flexible, both in terms of uh, what we program, and in this respect, John has just made some really good points, um, like you know, underrepresented and, and newly discovered repertoire, but also in terms of um, you know, the ensembles, the artists uh, who we present on a platform like DJ Stage, because it's not a, a multi-album, multi-year commitment. Um, it is, uh, well, it's not a coincidence that we've called uh, our series Musical Moments. So it's a, it's a moment in time, an important and powerful moment in time, but um, it lends us some flexibility in terms of, in terms of programming and, um, Actually, let me use that opportunity to also make the point that DG Stage by some people has been perceived as a closed shop where you can only be present and perform um, if you have like an exclusive artist agreement. And uh, let me also make clear, while obviously there's a focus on the artistic relationships that we you know, have grown and fostered and, and, and there's also a commitment to our artist community it is not a closed shop. We are open to interesting proposals, to uh, interesting new constellations. And uh, you will actually in the next weeks and months see a few artists um, whom you maybe wouldn't expect on, on DG stage. And, and just let me give you a recent example um, of that. I'm actually proud that we have presented Kit Armstrong with music by William Byrd and John Bull which is probably not something that people would expect on, uh, on Deutsche Grammophon easily. So, and this has been a wonderful concert and, and a great um, addition and, and the diversity of um, what we're trying to program and achieve um, has, is really, really important to me personally also. Great, Clemens. Thank you so much. The next question is for James. Um, it's from Carolina Marquez of the Medea Arts Management. Um, do you feel that audiences will get too comfortable with the abundance of high quality videos and will not feel like going back to the concert hall when uh, the lockdowns and restrictions are over? Uh, it's an excellent question. Uh, I don't have the answer for that. I think that sadly, uh, as we all know, a a large portion of the classical music audience is older people. And no matter what happens, some of these people have been to their last concert. They're not going to feel comfortable coming back. Um, so it is a very, a very difficult situation. You know, we have to be very concerned about, I mean, audiences are always, we're always dealing with this idea of replacement. Um, so I think we need to find a way to create a product that encourages people to come back to the concert hall as soon as they're comfortable, but also that provides something of real value to those loyal listeners and loyal lovers of our art form that may not honestly ever feel quite as comfortable as they did. 
Thank you, James. Um, the next question is for Hervé uh, from Ilonka van der Berken, who is the managing director of uh, Foundation Norder Concerten. I hope I said this correctly. Um, Hervé, is there an industry or a third party report about how people are actually benefiting from live streaming? From the artist's point of view, of course, there's a lot to give, but is there already an insight in how enjoyable people are actually finding their in-home experiences compared to live performances? I don't think there is an, uh, an official report or survey about that. Um, so that would be very useful for sure. I mean, we miss data in, in, in the business because everybody wants to protect his data. Everybody is afraid to share his data. And it's difficult to combine them and to, uh, to get benefits from that because it's still, it's still a, a new business. You know, there, as we said a few times, or I, as I always say, there is no uh, business yet really. I mean, that's a huge offer. Huge interest, millions, billions of views. Everybody is playing with billions and billions of what? I mean, is it, you know, do we count with the same value one Facebook Live of 10 seconds or one paying subscriber watching five, six programs a week, each one being two hours? And for the moment, many people are putting this one at the same, in the same total which is fine because everybody has to show that it's great, it's successful, it's wonderful, etc. So, but that's clear that, the, I mean, regarding a, a, a corporate um, understanding of the business and therefore the potential, we miss, we need to be more together for sure. And there is still too many uh, initiatives which are very uh, separate. For me, there is no competition yet. It's funny because we are very few to say that because when we see how much people can be aggressive about the rights, about the exclusivity, about everything, et cetera, regarding us or a few others, it's always strange for me because, you know, when we have money to catch and to share, happy to open the competition step. <laughs> but for the moment, I mean, it's only investment. For the moment, it's only risk. So uh, my feeling and my little business experience always tell me that it's better to be together than to be uh, like that. And, um, and that would help us yes, to have um, a good uh, or better or a first understanding of competing the, comp the communities, etc. And then we can answer to this uh, person asking, do we have a bit of, of understanding of the actual situation in five years etc like but we are just at the beginning you know so it will come for that's sure. true yeah. that's true thank you Ave. so uh, with this um let me pull up the results of our online poll uh which was um in response to the question of who's the most vulnerable party in this challenging and changing situation and i think cases could be made for each of these uh, but as we can see very clearly, artists have, uh, have won that contest. Um, and I think that's, that's right. But, uh, uh, the other members of our ecosystem are equally vulnerable. And, um, what I think the, uh, the, the discussion today has revealed is that truly the most vulnerable party in all of this is the one who refuses to learn and the one who refuses to embrace these changes that are inevitable. It could be any, any type of the, um, uh, of the participant, but it's, uh, it's really the attitude of um, refusing to uh, embrace the opportunities, but also the op not just the opportunities for learning, but the opportunities for collaboration. As uh, Hervé has said, you know, it's much better to uh, make a focus on solidarity and on partnership and uh, in that to look for strength and for uh, a chance to, to survive this, uh, this transformation. So um, thank you everybody for your participation, for your contributions. Um, I hand it back to Gosia with this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anastasia. Thank you to all of your wonderful panelists. And thank you to everybody who has joined today.
On behalf of the Global Leaders Program, the Spanish Association of Symphony Orchestras Classical Next, Banco de la República, Fundación BBVA, and Fundación Bolivier de Vivienda, we invite you now to stay with us for a special follow-up panel discussion focused on adapting the themes just discussed to the context of the arts sector in the Ibero-Americas. This Spanish language session entitled Enfoque Colombia will begin in 15 minutes following a short pause. In the meantime, I'd like to take this opportunity to share with you information about our next global session of Resetting the Stage, which occurs at the same time in two weeks on October 22nd. Entitled On the Call Concert Safety and Liability, this uh, it will explore the effects of pandemic related cancellations and the challenge of balancing the urgency of reopening and the responsibility towards the health of artists, staff, and audiences that mm. orchestra managers and festival directors have to face now. The global panel will include Felix Palomero from Spanish Ministry of Culture, Carmen Gloria Arenas from uh, Municipal Theatre in Santiago, Chile, Ana Cristina Abad from Colombia's Filharmonica de Medellín, Jose Valentin Centenero from Ampos, and Ana Maria Mateo from Asturias Symphony Orchestra, which will moderate this session. And now we conclude by saying thank you to today's exceptional panel, James, Hervé, Clemens, John, Maria, Claudia, and Christine. On behalf of all the public tuning in, we really appreciate you sharing your perspectives with us today. And of course, huge, huge thank you to Anastasia for your valuable input and help to moderate this fruitful session. Thanks to all of you who have joined. Have a good afternoon, good evening, or good rest of the day. Stay safe and healthy, and please join us in 15 minutes of a Spanish session. Thank you so much. Thank you.